Welcome this afternoon to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are continuing our uh, work of orienting the GovOps Committee of the 21-22 session uh, with mm -hmm. all of the areas of, of our jurisdiction. Um, and so we did have an opportunity to speak with the Elections Division of the Secretary of State's office in the context of moving H48 through, which I'm happy to report um, past all stages in the House and was messaged to the Senate today. So uh, they will be able to get going on their work on the bill. And so thank you to the Secretary of State's office for your excellent support on that bill. And now I want to welcome Secretary Condos to, uh, to help us with an on orientation and introduction to the other parts of your office. Well, thank you. Um, I I think before before I ask uh, Andrea to post our, our uh, PowerPoint, it's a it's a brief PowerPoint. Let me just identify the people who are on this this uh, Zoom with us. Uh, uh, obviously, you you know Chris Winters. Um, my deputy, Jenny Prosser, is our general counsel and municipal director. Lauren Hibbert is our uh, Office of Professional Regulation. Tanya Marshall uh, is um, our Visara, the state archives. Uh, and Stacy Drinkwine is our admin services and budget finance person. Um, so let me, let me start by... Are, are, Andrea, are you going to post this thing on online or? It is up posted. on our committee page, and I think most members um, have the ability to follow along um, okay. with the document on a different device. So that's what I would welcome folks to do. Um, All right, because it's not showing up in what I've got. So I'll pull mine up. Refresh. Is that what I have to do is refresh? Yep. If you go, if you look at today's date under documents and handouts, uh, you'll find overview of Secretary of State's office. Not on the Zoom call. No. Nope. Okay. That's that's where where I can't find it. Uh, hang on, I'll be there. All right, there we go. So I wish that was my office, but it's not. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, on, the, on the second page, um, you will see that we believe in smart, good government solutions. It's what we've focused on in the 10 years that I've been in office. And we have transformed the S Secretary of State's office uh, agency from what was a paper-driven process to a digital environment. Uh, it was paper-driven back in 2010, 11, and we're now totally, almost totally in a digital environment. We've gone from 0% uh, to 97, over 97% online activity. We give back every year, uh, starting around 2012, uh, we used to receive 1.8 million in general fund dollars at the beginning of the year, and then at the end of the year, anything would be swept. We now no longer receive that general fund dollars. We operate totally from uh, fees that we collect, and the general fund sweeps what we don't have from our Secretary of State Services Fund. Uh, one of the focuses for me has been customer service. Uh, when I first took office, um, my directive to all of my directors uh, was that we were not going to be a state agency that uh, didn't answer phone calls or didn't answer emails for four or five or six days, that we were going to answer the phone, answer our emails as quickly as we could, 
preferably within 24 hours. If we couldn't do it within 24 hours, at least let people know that we can't respond yet. Um, we have since become more efficient and accurate. We are, um, and I would also add more transparent. There is more information posted on our website on a daily basis than ever before. Uh, what we add stuff today that wasn't there yesterday, the year or the day before. It's a constant uh, work to, to update our, our website. Uh, what's our goal? Our goal is to do good work exceptionally well. We have four divisions at the Secretary of State's office. The Office of Pro Professional Regulation, which is better known as OPR. Uh, Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, better known as Vis Visara. Uh, elections and Corporations. Those are the four main divisions. And then we have uh, a what we call our fifth division, which is admin services. And that's basically our finance and budget uh, group that uh, deals with the everyday uh, finance stuff. In addition to this, we have other programs that many of you may, may know. One is the municipal assistance. We, uh, Jenny Prosser answers that phone uh, from municipalities all, and, and actually citizens and uh, municipal officers uh, were one, the one place that they can come to pretty much for information that they may not find elsewhere. Uh, for, and I, no knock on VLCT. VLCT is a member organization uh, and their, their customers or their clients are the municipal officers, the municipal towns. Uh, we also handle the Safe at Home program. We've now, the, the agent, uh, Secretary of State's office has had, we were the third um, third state to start a safe at home program. This is, is essentially a address confidentiality program for men, women, and children who are, uh, have been sexually abused, attacked of uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, et cetera. Um, we essentially have about, it, it fluctuates, but it's between 150 and 180 um, names that are on our list. It's, it's kept uh, under lock and key. It's in a vault when it's not out being used. Uh, but essentially the information allows people to use our address as their legal address. Uh, and then we collect their mail at the post office and, and, uh, and, and send it out to them. Um, we have the temporary officiants program, which started, uh, I would say, probably about 12 years ago uh, by the legislature. I was actually on finance when it was brought in. Uh, and uh, this allows for people to become a temporary officiant uh, to uh, be able to marry people. Um, there's a, a fee of $100, and that actually, that program has grown tremendously. Uh, since we started it, it used to be about 75,000 a year that we collected in revenues, and we're now collecting about 150,000 a year uh, in, in fees from that program. And this allows people to have their father marry, you know, their the daughter and, and boyfriend uh, or whatever, you know, a cousin or, or somebody else. Um, we also maintain the APA rules and legislative clerk. Uh, so we, we deal with that as well. Um, I do wanna, safe at home, I, I, I know many of you or some of you have, have heard this story, but we had a case a few years ago on the safe at home. Um, uh, the person who manages it called me in my office and said that she had a very angry individual on the phone. Uh, who insisted that we provide the name of the, of the person he was looking for because he wanted a, it was a welfare check on, on the uh, person's, uh, on a, a, uh, um, the, the woman who was in, uh, in the program, it was a welfare check on the daughter. And um, so the call came to me and the person identified themselves as a law enforcement officer and uh, that, but they were from Massachusetts, and and uh, but he needed this information to do a welfare check on the daughter. So 
my response to him was, well, you know, the program, I said, if you don't have a court, if you have a court order or uh, our, our law enforcement here in Vermont tells me to release it, I will. But other than that, I won't. He goes, well, I have a court order. And I said, well, send it to us. Um, didn't hear back from him. A week later, he called back. I guess he thought Vermont state government was a big place. He called back again and he got me on the phone and he said, I'm a law enforcement officer and I just want to uh, let you know that I need to do a welfare check and I need this person's name. And I said, well, last week you told me you were going to send me the court order. We didn't receive that. Oh, so long story short, when, it, when it got, I got off the phone that second time with him, I called the state police office and um, they sent, they did a welfare check. And as it turned out, this person was in fact a law enforcement officer from Massachusetts, but the person he was looking for was his wife who had left him and uh, looking for the daughter and uh, because of abuse in the first place. So this is the kind of program the safe at home is, and it can be men, women, or children. In our corporations and business services division, we, we strive for common sense solutions for business registration. Uh, the corporations division is responsible for the registration of business entities from small proprietorship to trade names to incorporations. It, it also is the filing repository for the uniform commercial code filings for the state of Vermont. And we also deal with uh, uh, nonprofits as well as profit companies. Um, when we first started in 2011, it used to take literally 14 to 15 days to get a to get your certificate back uh, that you had had successfully uh, set up your your company in the state uh, files. Now it's done within 20 to 30 minutes, almost in instantaneously. The same thing with filing uh, UCC codes. Uh, those used to take uh, somewhere between five and seven days to get filed. Today, they're done instantly. That's the kind of stuff that we've used uh, technology to, uh, to grow our services for uh, our customers, and that means Vermonters. Uh, we also have common sense solutions for the business registration side. Uh, we provide a business-friendly environment facilitating business throughout Vermont. Um, for corporations, partnerships, LLCs, UCC filings, trademarks, trade names, you name it. Um, we have worked with some of the largest uh, um, uh, con consolidation of companies, mergers, uh, for instance, uh, CVPS and Green Mountain Power a few years ago, uh, which was a very large and everything had to be timed just perfectly. Uh, we were able to do that. And when we started back in 2011, the first thing we did was we held a meeting uh, with Downs Rackland, uh, the, one of the, if not the largest law firm in Vermont, to determine what they saw as a need for this business friendly environment. And we have continued to reach out to the people who actually use the site to make sure that we're staying ahead of the game. Coming soon is the Vermont Business Express. In fact, later this afternoon, we were supposed to have a meeting uh, of the steering committee, but it's a, a collaboration between uh, the Secretary of State's office, Department of Tax, Department of Labor, and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. We're working toward the next phase of the one-stop business portal to assist businesses in starting, maintaining, and growing their businesses in Vermont. Uh, it will essentially bring when someone wants to start a business, it'll bring it all under one roof where they can, they, they can uh, not have to fill out the same information over and over and over again as they go from agency to agency. Um, it, it, it'll be a much more interactive type site. So if you sign on and you start registering your business that you want to uh, register uh, a, a convenience store, for instance, that, that you're going to start a convenience store. There are some, I don't know, 25 or 27 different licenses or certificates that you need to do that. Um, and the, the first three are that you are have that you're registered with the state of Vermont through our office. 
that you have your tax ID number, and that you have your uh, unemployment insurance number from the Department of Labor. Those are the very first things that you have to get. Uh, and that's why we chose those three to begin this process. Uh, and then we're also adding ACCD uh, and, and we'll, as time goes on, add more companies, uh, more agencies to this pile. And this is gonna be more interactive. So if someone is signing on to, to for instance, get their business registration for a, a convenience store, they may need several different ag uh, licenses or, or certificates for meat products, for dairy products, for scales, uh, for the different things that they sell in the, in the store. So the, the hope is that we'll get this to a point where it, uh, it'll actually be interactive and it'll, it'll say to you, okay, this is the business you're starting. Here's the different licenses you need. Uh, and, and they'll be able to do almost like, uh, I, I hate to say it, but the Amazon approach where you'll have a uh, shopping basket that, that as you sign up for everything, any fee that's associated will go into that shopping basket and you can pay it once instead of having to pay each and every time. The Office of Professional Regulation, Jim, uh, we strive- Can jump in for one second there? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, with your permission. I'd like to just um, make sure we point out, uh, Jim mentioned everybody's name in the beginning, but um, Stacy, if you are able, maybe um, turn your camera on for a second and just say hello to the committee so that you can put a, a face to the name. Uh, Stacy Drinkwine is very new to our office. Uh, we just hired her a few months ago and she went straight into doing our budgets because Stacy's not only the director of our corporations division, but she's also uh, the, the director of our business office. Um, and so she's in charge of our budgets here. So thanks, Stacy. Yeah, hi, glad to be here. So in the, in the Office of Professional Regulation, as I said, OPR, we strive for right fit regulation. We, we serve over 50 professions and approximately 80,000 licensees or certificate, certificates. We're currently onboarding the massage therapy profession for later this, this year. Uh, we serve the public, employers and licensees in all aspects of, of our lives and every day, from accountants to cosmetologists to nurses to veterinarians, uh, engineers, you name it, we, you know, tattooists, we, we, we do it. Uh, and we set and enforce the standards for licensure and for practice uh, and for the practice once they're licensed. Uh, we protect the public from unethical, incompetent, and unprofessional behavior uh, by licensed practitioners. And this, essentially what we are is, is a public, uh, public uh, safety um, a group that, that uh, works to make sure that uh, uh, you're not impacted negatively by a licensee, that they are following the standards of the profession. Uh, we work with several different groups. Um, you know, for instance, we recently, in, in recent years, we onboarded a, some several licenses from uh, natural resources when they found out that we could do it better than they could do it. It's mainly an administrative and re regulatory process, uh, and we've really perfected it well. And I will also tell you that we are uh, ensuring that equity and licensing and reg uh, regulations and discipline, we're working on improving licensure in the state through the smart licensing policy that benefits all while simultaneously targeting military families, individuals with criminal back backgrounds and new Americans. So we're reaching out to those groups to assist them in becoming productive members of our society. Uh, chapter 57 review gives uh, OPR the power to conduct a sunrise, a sunset, or a scope of practice review to ensure that government oversight of a profession is appropriate. We don't want to have uh, a heavy hand. We What we wanna do is have a protective hand. And, and I think it's uh, important that we have been recognized over the years uh, by the White House, uh, both the current administration and the previous administration for the efforts that we have. Chris and um, Chris Winters and Lauren Hibbert 
tra have traveled the country uh, for NCSL, for the NGA, the National Governors Association, and uh, for the Council of State Governments, uh, providing seminars and, and uh, uh, our input into this. We're considered one of the leaders uh, in professional regulation and doing it right. Thanks, Jim. I just want to jump in and, and have Lauren Hibbert say hello. Hello. It's really great to see you all. Um, some very familiar faces, some new faces. I'm really excited for the legislative session and starting to work with you all. And thanks for inviting us in. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Lauren's the director of the Office of Professional Regu Regulation. That's the position that I held before I became the Deputy Secretary of State. So while I love all of the divisions and directors equally, OPR does have a, a special place uh, in my heart. Uh, you'll see a lot of Lauren over this session. And as Jim mentioned, there's a, a lot of really cutting edge work that's been done in this Government Operations Committee and in the Senate Government Operations Committee to do professional regulation in a little bit different way than other states are able to do. And there's a lot of work there that we're very proud of in, in, in that right fit regulation that you only regulate a profession to the extent necessary to protect the public and you don't go beyond it. And you'll see some more of that in, uh, there's an annual OPR bill uh, with tweaks to all the many professions that we have. So uh, you'll be hearing from Lauren more this year. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up is the State Archives and Records Administration, VASARA. Uh, their mission is to preserve access to public records. It was established in 2008 uh, after a study group um, that actually began when, when I was in, in uh, the state Senate and oversaw Senate government operations. Uh, we had joined forces with the House GovOps to request a study uh, and it was established in that study was to bring public records uh, management together with the state archives. Uh, and that's what the result was, was in 2008. And uh, I believe if I'm not mistaken, the new facility opened in 2009 or 2010, but I believe it was 2009. I'm sure Tanya will correct me. Uh, and it was basically to administer the statewide records and information management program. It's charged with supporting all three branches of state government and local governments in better managing their records and information regardless of the format, uh, whether it's paper, digital, it doesn't matter, uh, or voice. Uh, according to federal and state laws, and including the Public Records Act, which we have over the last 10 years had several uh, uh, improvements to, uh, and we follow industry standards and best practices. Um, whoops, I think I went the wrong way here. Hang on. So the, the statewide records and information management program, it develops issues and maintains standards for managing public, public records. We perform uh, formal appraisals of public records and issue record management policies and record retention schedules. Tanya and her group work with uh, all the different agencies uh, and their records officers to, to do, come bring this about. Uh, we ensure that low cost secure repositories and systems for public records are available and that they can support compliance. Uh, we also operate a record center for inactive paper and analog state records. Uh, we, have, we take legal custody of the permanent state records, preserving and providing access through the physical state archives and digital state archives. We also support administrative rules, document authentication, and several filing functions of the Secretary of State's office as well. I will tell you that uh, uh, it's, it, I, I hope that your committees will, will take advantage of, uh, if, if, the, if the health situation gets better, uh, of, of visiting the uh, archives because it's, it's a really awesome place to be uh, and, and to actually see the, the original constitution and in, 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 uh, its protection. Um, that, that's their job is to protect those most precious documents that we have. Thanks, Jim. And, and Tanya, if yep. you could say hello here. And uh, Tanya's division is, is unique among our divisions in that 
It goes across all state agencies who were able to problem solve in, in records management. Um, Tanya has a wealth of knowledge uh, that all the various agencies in state government are, are, are constantly tapping into. Go ahead, Tanya. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to meet everyone and to see those returning to the committee. Um, and I'm glad I got my camera working. <laughs> what you didn't see was me working behind the scenes to get it to work. After 10 months, it might have burned out. Um, I look forward to working with you and you may see me come in for different types of public records bills that might come up. And always feel free to tap the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration with any type of legislative research that you might need or background. Um, that's what we're here for. We support a lot of different committees and, and legislators in doing background research. Um, happy to do it um, and also provide background. So always feel free to contact us or me directly. And I look forward with working with all of you this session. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Tanya. Next up is our elections division. Uh, free, fair elections and, and access to our democracy is something that's very uh, close to our hearts. Uh, we, we, we operate in that manner uh, pretty much all the time, every day. And, you know, since COVID hit, uh, we've had two uh, ongoing um, criteria that we followed for every decision we've made over the last year. Uh, the, the two involve protecting Vermonters' right to vote and two, to protect the health and safety of Vermonters uh, as well as our town clerks and, and poll workers at the same time. Um, we just came off an election where uh, our small but mighty elections team, total of five members, uh, although they picked up three honorary members and myself, Chris and Eric, uh, our chief of staff. Um, and, and it was a uh, very time consuming and burning out process over the last uh, 10 months. I mean, literally uh, Will and his team have been working six and seven days a week since April. Um, uh, in, in some cases, 10 or 12 hours a day uh, to ensure the, the integrity of our election in November. Um, they also have, uh, when I first took office, we had, uh, everything was paper driven, as I said before, but specifically in campaign finance and lobbyist disclosure, everything was paper and we would just upload a PDF of paper uh, so that it would, people would have access, but you couldn't do anything with it. Uh, you would have to make your own spreadsheets if you wanted to. Um, now with our campaign finance reporting and our lobbyist disclosure uh, reporting systems, uh, it, it's, it's out there, it's updated on a regular basis, it's instantaneous. Uh, when when uh, a lobbyist or a candidate files, hits the submit button, it automatically goes into position and it's filed where it belongs. Um, we hope that all of this information that we have encourages greater uh, civic participation, but really the integrity of our campaigns and our elections is really front and center for our entire elections team. Uh, we, and we also provide that customer friendly environment uh, that helps train citizens, voters, candidates, lobbyists, and public officials uh, by uh, providing the, the proper information uh, regarding the administration of federal and state law and, and elections, um, providing, uh, promoting voter registration. We are at the highest level we've ever been um, currently, and we over, obviously oversee and assist in the conduct of our elections. Now, there are two sets of elections. We have our federal and state elections, and then we have our local elections. We don't oversee the local elections. That is something that the town clerks do. As far as the federal and state elections, the town clerks assist us in managing that process, but we are the ones that oversee that process. So it's two distinct areas, but uh, the goal for both is to make sure that we have free, fair, and accessible elections. Um, as part of that process, our election staff will continue to work towards uh, improving and, and providing for an online campaign finance disclosure and online lo lobbyist disclosure. And we provide ongoing training as needed uh, and support and guidance to the 248 town clerks uh, and city clerks. 
uh, and, and something that we're kind of proud of following the two. Well, let me go back. 2012, we were ranked 38th in the nation by what is called the Election Performance Index, which is now handled by the MIT Election Data and Science Center. Um, before it was held by the, it was managed by the Pew uh, Charitable Trust. Um, so we were ranked 38th in 2012. In 2014, we had improved to 16th in the nation. After the, imp the implementation of our new state-of-the-art system, uh, election management system, we had jumped to first overall in the nation. And following the 2018 election, it usually takes about 18 months for this data to come out. But following the eight, uh, 2018, we had uh, slipped a little bit to third, uh, which was not a surprise because other other states were starting to put new systems in place as well. But we're very proud of that over the last two general elections, we have been in first or third place uh, in the nation uh, for uh, election integrity and performance. Thank um, you. Well, yep. Is Will there? He is. They've all had a chance to meet Will, but say hello, Will. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> I will just say <clears throat> I'm really looking forward to working with you all this year. Um, good to see a few faces back that haven't been around in a while. Rep Higley, good to see you. Um, it has been the favorite part of my job over the last 10 years, working with the legislature and the legislative committees and with both House GovOps and Senate GovOps. Over the last eight years, we've made a lot of progress uh, with the election law and the election process in Vermont. Um, so I hope we, I have no doubt that we'll keep doing that and I'm looking forward to it this year. Um, I would just quickly note that there is absolutely no rest for the weary for any of you or for us um, in terms of trying to figure out how we administer the local elections for the first six months of this upcoming year. So I look forward to your help and we work together toward that goal of, like Jim said, safe, secure and fair elections. Thanks, Will, that's, that's really well said. And I think it's worth repeating that these successes that we're talking about are only possible because we have had such a great working relationship with the legislature and you all have enabled us to be successful. Um, and so we're looking forward to doing more this year. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Will. Uh, next up is municipal assistance. It's, it's manned by the very able Jenny Prosser. Uh, she, she supports uh, Vermont towns one call at a time and, and to the tune of about 1,200 calls a year. Um, Vermont's communities cannot function without the service and commitment of our public officials. And as a result, the Secretary of State's office believes it's very important that our local leaders and even our citizens have help navigating the complex and ever-changing laws that may apply to them. And Jenny is our full-time general counsel dedicated to municipal assistance, handles much of that. Uh, although I think that I know that Chris and Eric and I and, and Will and his team also get involved, but uh, uh, you know, Jenny handles the, the brunt of it. Uh, she, she responds to dozens of inquiries every, every, literally almost every day about municipal government, open meetings, public records access. Uh, she answers questions posed by both members of the public as well as officials covering almost every topic you can imagine uh, that affects local governments uh, from abatement proceedings to zoning ordinances. Um, our municipal assistance and support extends to fielding uh, 100 plus calls each month from members of the public. Uh, as I said, 1,200, over 1,200 a year uh, from both public and municipal officials. Uh, we, have, we have information about open meetings and public records and ethics, town meetings and local elections, officer roles and responsibilities. Uh, municipal topics from A to Z, from animals, cemeteries, and fire districts, to land use, libraries, and marriage, to ordinances, roads, and taxes. Uh, providing free publications to help local officials do their jobs better, and to strengthen Vermont's communities by encouraging civic participation. Um, we participate in trainings for local boards on request. Uh, we also hold a biannual 
uh, and this is the year that we'll do it again, uh, the Transparency Tour, which is a series of trainings for public officials and community members at usually 12 to 15 locations around the state uh, in, a, in the off year. Uh, we do it out, off year from the, the elections for obvious reasons. Uh, so Jenny, are you out there? I am, hello. Thanks for having me and always feel free to shoot questions my way or send your constituents my way if things come up in the municipal, municipal matters or open government. And Jenny is a, uh, a fifth unofficial division of the office. We talk about our four divisions as corporations, Visara, OPR, and elections. But Jenny is a division of one and a tremendous resource for everybody out there. As more and more people know that she's there and what a great job she does in answering their questions, she, you know, she gets rewarded with more calls and more emails. Um, but you should feel free to ask her questions anytime, uh, especially around open meetings and public records. She's really uh, become quite an expert. No rest for the weary. <laughs> okay. Uh, the office shows tremendous national leadership. As I said, uh, it, you know, uh, as I said, I have been the president of the National Association of Secretaries of States. Uh, that was two years ago. Uh, I'm, I've been a member of the member of the Council of State Governments Executive Committee. Uh, I've also been a member of the Department of Homeland Security Critical Infrastructure Governing Government Co Coordinating Council. Uh, I am the current national co-chair with my Washington colleague, state of Washington colleague, uh, Kim Wyman, Secretary of State in Washington uh, of the Council of State Governments Overseas Military Initiative, Voting Initiative. Uh, you know, Lauren, as I said earlier, Lauren and Chris have gone around the country to testify, provide expert testimony on professional regulation. As I said, we also have the number one and number three state rankings in the elections performance index over the last two election cycles. And we are the first state with a new, a, a fully ADA compliant accessible voting system. And let me explain that one a little bit. A couple of years ago, we, we knew that we had to do something. Of, we have a federal mandate to provide a, uh, uh, for the visually impaired uh, accessible voting. Um, and we had an old analog system that was costing us literally half a million dollars a year to operate. Uh, and it was, um, we had about 20 people that used it. So it was a tremendous cost, but it was a federal mandate and we were trying to figure out what could we do. And we, we worked with a, a, a group called Democracy Live that had this new ADA compliant accessible voting system that is literally fully ADA compliant. It doesn't matter what your disability is, you can use this system. And it has a side uh, improvement that, that we're continuing to work on and try to utilize, which will allow over, perhaps allow, allow overseas and military voters to be able to vote uh, through the system, through a secure portal that they have. Because um, right now it is sometimes difficult uh, with postal service around the world uh, being impacted. Uh, so, the, so those are some of the things that we, we do. I also serve currently on the board of advisors of the EAC, the US EAC, which is out of Washington. It's a, uh, the election assistance commission. Um, and you know, we work on best practices and, and things like that for election systems. So we do have a national approach. Chris, did you want to add anything here? No, I, I don't. I don't think so. Not on that, Jim. I, I know we'll have time for people to ask questions. Yep. And I do just want to extend an invitation to any of you. If you do have questions you don't want to ask here, you want to get in deeper on any one of our divisions or services or the subjects that we cover, uh, I have an open virtual door and would be glad to meet with any one of you. Uh, I've done this for for new members in the past to. Uh, help with orientation and answering your questions. So please do reach out. We'd be happy to talk to you about any of the things that we do at the Secretary of State's office. So here's our staffing uh, report, if you want to call it. Um, this is the Secretary of State's office in our corporations and business services. We have five employees that generate 
a tremendous amount of money, well over seven or $8 million. Uh, that's pretty much what the office operates under. Uh, the Office of Professional Regulation has 38 staff, uh, including the director. The State Archives and Records Administration has 18, including the state archivist. Um, and we do have, we're gonna have a request for the legislature to add, uh, to provide us a new position for the state archives. We already have it in our budget. It's been in our budget. It's in our proposed budget for 22, um, but the administration is not releasing any uh, new positions at this point. Uh, and this is a position that works actually with all of the uh, uh, historical societies and libraries around the state uh, at your in your off in your towns and and uh, uh, they've they've you know I guess I, I could let Tanya just jump in if she's still around uh, to give a little more emphasis on this but this is something that she has been on a grant uh, to us for the last three years but we've maxed out that that grant and we now have to assume it but we need the position in order to move forward and there would be no uh, additional impact to the state. Tanya sure. do you want to add? Yeah, thank you. This is part of our historical records program. Um, we receive a lot of calls at the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, obviously for public records, which are part of our statute. And we also have a little provision um, within the statute to also provide services, particularly grants that can come in um, to help historical records repositories throughout the entire state. Um, so we have this position. Um, it's a roving archivist. It travels throughout all the towns and also helps town clerks as well. Um, we work with emergency management on emergency on uh, disaster um, uh, recovery and emergency management um, it's been a great resource so the the intent of that was you know consolidating into one resource and having that person be able to do a lot of things that um, these historical societies and libraries and smaller repositories can't do um, so that's what that position is for thank you thanks tanya um you know, I can't tell you how important that position is. It's and it's a unique position. There is no other like it in the state government. Uh, so we will be asking for support to add a that position, even even though it's already in our budget. We don't have to add any additional funding for it. Um, elections division has five employees, as I said earlier, the mighty but small uh, elections team. It's the smallest elections division in the country. That includes Will. Um, and we, uh, as we go down the discussion process uh, of changing some of our election processes, uh, we're also going to be asking for a new position here. We cannot do what we did this past year again without additional staffing. It was as I said, we were putting in a lot of overtime uh, and it uh, um, the burnout was, I was really fearful as the year was coming closer and closer to November 3rd uh, that, you know, and, and frankly, if one of us had gotten sick, we would have really been problem, had a problem. So um, we've been at five employees for my 10 years as secretary of state. And it's time now to ask the legislature to approve a new employee for that division. Um, so I think if I'm not mistaken, that is it. Uh, you can contact any of us at any time. We can, we can provide more information for contact information, uh, you know, by, by uh, division directors. Uh, so you can ask questions if you have, uh, but we are, we are an open book. We, we believe that open government is good government. And we also believe in providing good customer service. I'll end right there and ask if there's any questions. Mark Higley. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I'd just like to uh, reach out and say how much I appreciate uh, Will's efforts uh, during the past election. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, relatively new town clerks and even though bulletins go out, it's certainly a huge uh, help to, to have Will reach out and, and call directly to these people. And uh, I think uh, uh, going into the future, I think there's actually gonna be more and more of that. Uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, folks that are kind of at the retirement age are getting ready to be done. And you're going to have a lot, a lot of new um, municipal elected officials, whether it's listers or you name it. I mean, um, so it's, it's more important than ever to have people that uh, really can reach out more than just with a bulletin. And I certainly appreciate that. Um, the one question I maybe do have for Secretary Condos is, um, um, and, and maybe, this, maybe this should be a, a question answered offline, but um, you know, with, the, with the ability to go um, <clears throat> digi digital so much more, um, are you confident in, in the ability to uh, keep what you have safe and secure? Uh, I know what, you know, the cybersecurity issues are, are at a forefront now. And, and I, I guess I, I just worry about that and, and you know, the, the budget for that sort of thing. And, and uh, anyway, do you feel confident that uh, you're, you're headed down a, a good road here? Uh, thank you. Absolutely, we are, Mark. And thank you very much for that question, because it is a really, really important question. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that um, several things first. Let me just say that our office has been focused on cybersecurity uh, since probably 2013. At least that's when I started to focus on it was 2013. I came back from a conference. Uh, my colleague from uh, the Secretary of State from Oregon uh, was at the conference and, and she told us one night at dinner that her office had been breached. Uh, and that when we all get back home that we should check on our, our uh, cybersecurity status. Um, she's, by the way, the new, now the governor of Oregon. Um, but I, I, I will say when I got back, I, I pulled my uh, IT manager aside and I asked him, I said, how are we, what's our, what's our profile? What are we, how are, what's our status in, in cybersecurity? And he goes, that's a great question. I think, he says, I think we're in really good shape, but it wouldn't hurt for us to go out and hire a outside firm to take a look at it. And we did in 2013. And we had an extensive report in 2014. Uh, it was, by the way, it was a Vermont company, a young Vermont company that had Defa Department of Defense clearance uh, and did a lot of stuff in, in Washington, D.C. And they have grown dramatically. They have about 50 or so employees in Vermont. They also have offices, I think, in Boston, New York, or Boston, Washington, and I believe somewhere in Texas now. So they've grown tremendously, but they're based out of Vermont. Uh, as you can imagine, they're a bunch of young people. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't begin to know the first thing about cybersecurity. I just know that they have to. They better cover my butt for that. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we we do annual uh, vulnerability and risk assessments. We do annual penetration testing to see. We hire you know professionals to try to hack into our systems, um, and, and you know we we take what they give us for, for you know, for, you know we, t we take it to heart and we actually work to secure those systems. And obviously a lot of the discussion has been since 2016 on and the Russian attacks on our election systems, uh, but we do it agency wide. We don't focus just on elections. And, and the last thing I wanna say is, and this is important in the area of elections with the voter checklist, um, it is backed up every night so we have an image of it. So if something were to happen, we can go back 24 hours and reset it. And we have that capability, not capability. We, have, we do that across the agency. So everything we do is backed up on a nightly basis so that we, if we do get hacked, we can set up relatively quickly. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you, Representative Higley, <laughs> it's, it, it, cybersecurity is like a race without a finish line. It is going, it's our new normal and every state agency, you better be paying attention to it because uh, just because you're good today doesn't mean you're good tomorrow. And we all have to be uh, wary of, of, of those uh, situations um, and, and we take it very seriously. Well, thank you for that, uh, Jim. And coming from energy and technology, I had a, you know, some of the inside scoop as to actually what you're talking about. And it is becoming pretty scary uh, where you, you're going to be too hard to even keep up with it. But I appreciate that. You're welcome. 
Other questions from committee members? Now is the time where I want to welcome you to make an inquiry, ask a question, even if you think everyone else in the room already knows the answer, because uh, it is entirely possible that they do not. Uh, Peter Anthony. Yes, uh, good afternoon. The troops from Jim Condo's shop. Thank you very much, it's a great uh, uh, overview. Uh, my uh, question or comment uh, actually goes to the Division of um, Professional Regulation. I had the pleasure last session of supporting and voting in favor of an expansion of some of the reciprocity work that your office has been engaged in, melding fees and so on and so forth. Um, what I tripped over in another conversation last session was a, uh, a difficult um, <clears throat> obligation on the part of towns in the area of assessment and reappraisal. And I had reached out to um, the uh, illustrious member from Chittenden, as a matter of fact, because they knew he was on government ops last session and said, you know, I, I don't know how we're gonna crack this, but the state has an interest in making sure that the grand list in the towns is up to date and the CLA discussion and, you know, people being 10 years without a reappraisal. And I have discovered that if you call to get a reappraisal uh, as a town clerk or town manager, you can be prepared to wait anywhere from three to six years. And it's because there are very few firms, I guess. And I will pursue this with Ms. Hibbert, I think offline, but uh, it seems to me that there is a bottleneck there. And I'm not sure it is at the Secretary of State's office as opposed to some of the private trade organizations, which also certifies in those areas. But uh, the state definitely needs to open the gates in the reciprocity area so that there are more uh, folks able uh, to answer calls for reappraisal at the town level and correct the CLA problems. Thank you. Lauren, did you want to answer anything there? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Anthony, I think what you're touching on is a very, um, it actually affects many people on this call because it affects Jenny Prosser as well at the municipal level. Um, but the assessors um, and the appraisers um, through towns are different than the appraisers that OPR regulates. There may be some cross, um, you know, some Venn diagramming, some people who are appraisers who are also assessors, but um, the appraisers that OPR regulates are the appraisers that do appraisals for mortgage companies upon the purchase and sale of a house of, um, or a commercial facility. Um, the appraisers that you're referring to are um, with the town and regulated by the Department of Tax, but it doesn't mean that um, we shouldn't continue the conversation um, and try and figure out if we can release that bottleneck that you're referring to. Thanks, Lauren. And Representative, Representative Anthony, let me just also say, uh, I, I'm a 18 year member of the, the South Burlington City Council. Um, and we went through at least two uh, reappraisals during that time. And I think a lot of times what happens is that the, and, and this is not a knock, it's just the way government works. Uh, but towns sometimes will wait until they're real close to the edge before they decide they need to go out for their reappraisal. And then at that point, it's two or three years later before they can get it actually completed. Uh, and, and I know we always, when I was in South Burlington, our action step line was, uh, I think about 85%, we would start to think about how are we gonna do this going forward? Uh, because we didn't wanna get stuck in that never ending battle trying to get an appraiser to come in. And you're right, there are very few companies that do it. Um, and most are from out of state, unfortunately. Well, thank you very much anyway. You're welcome. Other Any questions? other questions? All right, Tanya. 
Madam Chair, um, Secretary Condos, I'm wondering if there is any proposal or thought to move towards the expansion of automatic um, voter registration beyond simply driver's licenses, as we know driver's licenses aren't held by everyone and will the lack of that holding will likely disproportionately impact people with disabilities, people with lower incomes and new Americans. So I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are on how we might expand that to truly touch everyone. It, it's something that we constantly look at. We actually have legislation that allows us to work with other agencies, but keep in mind the questions that we ask versus the questions that some of these other agencies may ask. Uh, the reason why uh, DMV works is because they ask the same three questions we do. Are you a U.S. citizen? Are you a Vermont resident? And are you 18 or over? Um, that's pretty easy information to grab when you're talking about driver's license. Um, we also have uh, the um, 17 year olds are able to register if they're gonna be 18 by the general election. So those are components that we already have. That was the primary driver for automatic voter registration across the country, but it's also embedded in federal statute that other state agencies are allowed to provide that information. The question is, and I think Will can answer this better, but uh, uh, I believe that if, if I remember correctly, Will, we have we have links on some of those other agencies' websites to the voter registration, the online voter registration so that they can register. Uh, is that correct, Will? Yes, and, and more generally too for years, um, under the MVRA, they do offer standard registration and opt-in style registration at all the other social service agencies. And we get a packet of registrations, paper form registrations from those agencies on a periodic basis. But um, my answer would be, we're always open to talking about expansion of that automatic system. Secretary Condos hit on the, the important points that um, make it tricky it's about collecting the right information, transmitting that information. And uh, a really sticky wicket with DMV was the fact that they didn't store the citizenship information. Um, and it took a lot of coordination with them to, for us to be able to get the citizenship status of potential voters without DMV actually storing that information in their database. And that will be tricky with other agencies also, um, but we're willing to work on it. And I think too, uh, Rep. Vyhovsky is, is the, one of the problems is funding. Uh, that's not something we would fund. It, it's something that the agency has to fund because it, it's uh, it's it's that digital footprint, if you want, that they have to be able to connect to our bridge to our system, uh, and uh, um, so it, it 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 is a question of sometimes that stuff doesn't work. It doesn't mesh. Uh, digitally, and and we have to. It took us several years to get it with, right with uh, the motor vehicle department, um, and and we were only able to move forward once they had had uh, uh, figured out that bridge, uh, and then we were able to actually step it up from there. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? or highlights from work that the legislature has done in the last biennium that uh, that you think you'd like to hear the Secretary of State's office comment on? We do enjoy working with this committee. Obviously the House and Senate GovOps are, are really the lifeblood for much of the work that we do. Um, uh, you know, it crosses pretty much across all of our agency uh, and that's, actually a good thing to have a, a, a good consistent group that we can work with that understands uh, the things that we do. Uh, and, and we're, as Chris had said, we're more than willing to step up. And uh, uh, if you have questions, we can, we can do a Zoom meeting or whatever to discuss something or uh, even, uh, you know, once, once things get better, have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Oh, we're hoping for that day soon. And maybe we could travel to Bradford for that coffee. I know where you could find some coffee. Some good coffee. <laughs>
Um, well, I know for a fact that we have um, intentions of getting back together with OPR and elections on <clears throat> on um, upcoming bills and debriefing the the 2020 election. So I know that we'll see some of you back sooner rather than later. Um, but thank you, Secretary Condos, for, for this great presentation. Um, if there are no other questions from committee members, we will let you go about your day. Thank you for spending so much time with us. Thanks for having us. We're, we're here to serve. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that is a wrap for our committee meeting for today. Um, we have uh, an evolving agenda that is posted on the legislative uh, website. And for those following along on YouTube, I would just make note that you will see two time blocks um, on agendas in future weeks uh, that, that uh, advertises when I will be holding office hours. Um, it is my hope that members of the public or the press or lobbyists or advocates who have um, ideas or questions that they want to ask of, uh, of me as committee chair would have uh, a more of an open opportunity to ask those, uh, just as if we were in the state house and anyone could walk up to me while I'm on my way to the house floor or or even on my way to the facilities. Um, and so the office hours uh, will, will be an opportunity for folks to come and meet. Um, let us know what, you, what your question or, or idea is. And so if people want to access office hours, uh, all they need to do is send an email to our committee assistant and, um, and we can make time available to meet so that that time will be published on the agenda. And so committee members, I would um, say congratulations on being first out of the gate with uh, the first bill to pass through all stages of passage in the 2021 session. And um, for all of that good hard work, you have earned yourself a, an early reprieve at the end of the day today. So um, by all means, get some fresh air and exercise and return those constituent emails that are piling up. And um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning in committee at 9 a.m. Good work on the floor, Madam Chair. Thank you.